hearing to add a parcel to an existing industrial facilities tax district, and that's the display pack. Um, so that would be here. The committee's already met and has a recommendation for approval to the council. And we have the consent agenda. We have the, the uh, minutes and the checks. The correspondence, right place newsletter. Unfinished business. Um, first is a second consideration for uh, the recommendation not to exercise the right of re first refusal and allow the property at 280 North Main Street to go to auction. Destination of what? Uh, the dairy. Yes, our car out the corner. It's mainly the parking lot, the north parking lot, yeah. that's critical on the road. I was up there talking with her on that. Yeah, she says that's her property. She runs into this every two years. Uh, the deal is, is she makes fences on two, two lots there. And Kent County always gets it mixed up and puts all of it towards one payment. So one lot ends up having extra taxes paid and the other one shows unpaid. So then every two years she has to deal with it. She says and it's up to date now. That's a good okay. point to And yeah. so that's, I told her she needs to get with county. Mm -hmm. But we're not buying it. It's <laughs> <laughs> not our problem. No. Okay. Uh, the next is a motion to consider a proposed agreement between the City of Cedar Springs and the Red Final Festival. And I, uh, yesterday, I sent out, you know, yesterday or early this morning, one of the two, uh, sent out to council the comments our city attorney had. Did you want me to go through those? I'm good. We're good. We're good. I had a, in addition to that, I, I had a couple of comments also. Um, it's going to be similar to what I've said before. Uh, number one, as I've said before, I don't have any issues with assisting the, the uh, Red Final uh, Festival on the payments. My biggest concern is that with the cost, it, it looks like from what I could gather, the first year cost would be almost $11,000, and then there's no method for cost containment going forward that I could find. Um, and again, I would weigh in the same as the city attorney did, that uh, we believe that the three-quarter vote of the city council, which would be six members, um, we feel that that's illegal. And we've expressed that before. Uh, in the annual report, I would suggest adding some financial report language similar to that in the agreement with, uh, that we just approved with the museum. that says uh, provide financial disclosure to the city as reasonably necessary for legitimate government governmental purposes, or we could add language that's uh, in the Skinner Field Agreement that is just a catch-all that says, and such other information reasonably requested by the city. Concern being is that if we're, if we're supporting something, we may need financial information for the auditors, and that's why I think we need to have something like that. Um, Would their monthly or year-end statement count suffice for that? I would have to. I would have to uh, defer to the auditors. Okay. Okay. Well, we You're not the state. Yeah. Anyway, well, the state. You know, we, there's different reporting requirements and different things like that. So I can't say just because it's for the state. Yeah. Uh, this, the next was there's a area in term uh, entitled alterations of public air areas. It allows the Red Flannel Festival to make additional alterations and improvements. But there was nothing in there that says that, that if they, they did it and no longer used the area, that they would have to put it back into the prior condition. I uh, wanted to note that. Uh, there is an attachment for DPW costs. However, they're not identified in the agreement as being paid by the um, city. So. If that's the intent, then I would suggest that it would be put into the agreement so there's no confusion. Because just attaching it means nothing legally. Um, the same is with the city, the list of city services required. It's attached, but there's no reference in the agreement. So in talking with the attorney, merely attaching it without having some type of <coughs> reference in the agreement does not make it binding. And then the use of the EPW uh, garage for golf course cards, Tom and I talked about it. Just have a uh, issue with the security of the building. 
There's a lot of you know people come and go. There's a lot of uh, material in the garage, chemicals, different things like that. Uh, so it's a concern that, that we would have about in, in and out and uh, access to everything that's in the garage. So those, uh, along with what the city attorney weighed in on, those are my comments. Next would be a Skinnerfield update, and Sean's going to be here tonight to do that. Any, uh, and the next is the mayor, mayoral business matters. I don't know if you have anything. Nothing. Under new business uh, would be an action on waiving policy number 12 so you can act on adding a parcel to the existing industrial facility tax district. To clarify on that last, this is is this that same 12 feet foot strip of land? The city strip, yep. This yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there, okay. But it's north of the um, access road going back to the blue part. Of the um, but that's 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 the, our second thing. We're adding the adding the. Um, Making that addition is is actually what what we refer to as parcel B. Mm -hmm. It's um, a, a piece that's not been in there. It's contiguous to the industrial development district. The next action item is uh, again a motion to waive policy 12 to act on an option to purchase a city strip of land by Hanson Realty. So that's the one we were referencing. Okay. okay. Uh, next is. Uh, Waiver of Policy 12 to act on the Nelson Township Fire Agreement at first consideration. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but uh, neither myself or Tom or Lee caught that, that it had expired. We hasn't stopped us from performing our duties, so we're um, going to ask to have it renewed and talking with Tom. We're going to put some thought into how we can make this more than an annual agreement. And uh, The only concern being is that we do it annually because so that we can put in the new costs. But we're, Tom is also wants to sit down and talk about how we can do a better job of smoothing, especially in terms of high ticket equipment items like a truck. So we've got a little work to do on it. Uh, the next is a motion to waive policy 12 so you can act on resolution uh, 2015-23 and that's amending uh, the, the budget so we can account for that payment to the museum. The next is a um, new policy, policy 14, that's been rec recommended to us by our assessor. Uh, the state of Michigan is going out and auditing, uh, assessing operations of communities, and one of the things that um, they're finding a number of communities don't have is, is that type of a policy. So we want to get this in place before um, we get gigged by it. The next is a motion to approve a license agreement with the City of uh, Cedar Springs and uh, Yankee Zephyr Racing Promotions. Uh, they were very pleased with their initial race last year. They had a much better uh, turnout than anticipated given the short uh, time that they had to get the word out. So they're looking at a two-day event. They're going to ask, also add a snow cross track. They're going to move things uh, more to the west on the property. So if you took uh, West Street and extended it straight south, all the activities would be to the west of that. They're also uh, are asking permission to smooth out the south part of that area for their uh, drag strip. They ran that by the environmental attorney. They're only going to go down six inches. They're not going to they're just going to smooth it out. And that was going to be my question. Yeah. So it's, it, do, it doesn't uh, impinge on the cap. So and anytime we have requests to do something in that area, we always run it by the environmental attorney and uh, our city engineer. So they've given us the approval. It's the same thing. They're going to pay us uh, $500 for the event for that time period. And they're going to contract with the fire department for uh, medical first responders and plus a response vehicle on site. We will have our insurance providers and all yeah, that. Yeah, we get that in advance. Um, 
Next is a motion to waive policy 12 to act on a resolution that would authorize the Red Flannel Festival as a community event. Everybody has that. Uh, next is a motion to waive policy 12 to act on waiving all fees for the uh, 2015 Red Flannel Festival. And the uh, final item is a discussion regarding waiving sidewalk display permit and bench fees. I think that was something that Hopkins asked to put on. Well, that was something we talked about the summit. Maybe we could have two of those. Uh, council thought about it because at the summit meeting they mentioned how the downtown started thriving after they started waiving the fees. And it encouraged the business owners to start putting out their seating and doing uh, uh, sidewalk signs and displays and stuff like that. Then our fees are not that expensive. No. But for some people, any expenses are expensive. Well, we discussed this at the planning commission meeting, and uh, Mr. Antonini's advice was if they can't afford the $10 bench fee, we shouldn't even visit. Okay. Yeah. Additionally, yeah. Yeah. Jerry, you own a business. Okay. You own a business. Correct. Right. You're asking the council to waive a fee when you own a business for a business. I pay all my I'm not talking about just me. I'm talking about in general. I, okay. I understand. <laughs> you own a business. Correct. You're asking that the council waive fees for businesses when you own a business. Correct. That's a concept. I exempt myself from it. The same way that I'd expect anybody else to. Okay. I'm asking your opinions on it. Because if Rose sat there in the same summer meeting I did, so did Dad, and they all encouraged their municipalities to start doing this. I actually support all that stuff. But if you get a bench and a table and a sign, you're going to have to be really careful about plugging up with the front. Well, they should still follow the same ordinance stuff, which is way easier. Still make them carry the liability insurance. Yeah. And fit, you know, the same parameters of the sidewalk edge and corners and stuff like that and doorways. I would support it. I would do anything in my power to get businesses in this town to thrive. But, like, it, for you to bring it in as a conflict of interest, you must say it's set out on it. So, um, I think this will be a discussion. Okay. And perhaps you may be at uh, a subsequent meeting of another council member to bring it up? Would that be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just feel very yeah. uncomfortable. Well, I, I understand that. A business owner, it's hard to be in these meetings because everything's a conflict of interest. Anything we do in this town can better or worsen their business. Maybe Mr. Tuesday would be interested in bringing this to the council meeting. Well, he's a business owner, too. Not anymore. Well, yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll do that. One, one last thing, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I forgot to mention that. Dwayne McIntyre is asking that we make that addition to the agenda for the approval of the um, amendment to his uh, planned unit development for his condominium project. Okay. And that was uh, so the um, item K. K. Right. And we want to do policy number 12. I J would be. The sidewalk sales that you. Maybe I do. So we have a for the chamber for them to look at sidewalk sales and do the money. And then so the next item. Is K? McIntyre would be K, I believe. I don't have K on there. Right, no, we need to add it. Add that. Oh, I see. Yeah, that was another one. Okay. So after the planning commission. Okay. So the planning commission approved that site plan on Tuesday night. It certainly would could benefit, and I, I know uh, Linda sent out the minutes from the planning commission, so mm -hmm. we've had a chance to review those and have an understanding. But yeah, that would be appropriate. We, 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 we would know what the language would be. That motion to approve site plan. It was the PUD amendment. Yeah. 
just phase two of, of uh, the Pines Condominium Association yeah. and uh, it's never been a, approved before. They had some conceptual drawings originally. The original drawings had uh, 16 units in there. So we cut it down to 10 and then we put some open space in the back. Right now we have a community garden over here in this corner. Um, so everything is directly off Needlewood now versus a road coming in. That road, that little road, made it very cost prohibitive. <laughs> it's amazing how much that road cost. But uh, so we came up with this: it's, it's less homes, more open space, and uh, um, a much simpler plan. And these are all what we call zero-step ADA aging in place. Um, kind of the same thing we did in phase one, just a little different layout. Originally, the site plan of that PUD required 16 units like you see there now. In order for him to change that, he had to go through the planning commission to change that existing site plan pool. And we modified it and then we approved that Tuesday night to do those 10 units versus 16. Uh, they were at the planning commission last month. There was a snag there. Um, there was a notified... Uh, Association. Oh, the Homeowners Association. The Homeowners Association. Yeah. And we didn't know it. He didn't know it. They didn't notify it. So we tabled it from last month and it was Tuesday night. And yeah. we approved that site plan. So now he is okay. coming here asking us, the city council, for the last step. And, and is this time sensitive? For me it is. Uh, Customers. Double <laughs> month. Yeah. Oh, it's and just to clarify, if I understand correctly from reading the um, minute, that road is actually, like, the DEQ doesn't even want it. Is that my understanding? Like, the, Oh, you're the, talking the trail. Yeah. The trail. Yeah, the DNR. The DNR. Yeah, they do not like private access any more than they have to. They so, don't totally eliminate them, but they right. don't. So they actually would prefer that we do it this way. Yes. Even though it wasn't yeah. the original. Yeah, he sent a letter recommending I put a fence up. <laughs> well, we're talking two different things. So, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the DNR didn't weigh in on that drive into the property. Right. Okay. The yeah. DNR I was just in on a trail connection. Okay. Through yeah. that property. Yeah. Uh, Just clarifying. Yeah. The association didn't want it. Uh, yeah, neither association. Like nobody wanted it, and we're voting to say you don't have to do it. <laughs> well, basically, we're, nobody wants. we're proving it as drawn, right. which does not have that in there. Okay, any other? And really, the, the recommendation is going to be that the that, uh, planning commission made was to recommend approval to the city council condition upon. Number one, the city council determining that sidewalks are only needed on one side of Needlewood that currently exists because there's none on the other side at all. And it's fully developed along there. And yeah. Other than this strip. Other than this strip. And if you put it in there, it'd go nowhere. And there's no leverage to get those other properties to add. The second would be a determination regarding the pathway connection to the White Pine Trail. It was an whether the escrow was ever in conflict with the city for the development agreement. We can't find any indication that there ever was. Uh, we have uh, a communication from the state saying that they don't want another connection there. So that just has to be uh, pointed out. And then the typical review and approval from other applicable departments and agencies. So it's pretty simple. Yeah. So if there's anything? I think you got it. I have one question. That the big empty area behind the condos, the open yeah. space, does that belong to you or the condos? That'll belong to the the Pines Condominium Association. Okay. 
and we're done. This all gets turned over to them. They they currently have a company that does the lawn care and snow removal and everything. Yeah. And they're they sprinklers, all that they stuff. They could decide at some point in the future that they wanted to build more. No, no they can't. Oh. No. Okay. No. Once this is done, this is recorded, and it's it is what it is. Oh, they can't yeah. ever add on to it. There's no want. access. I no see. more. No more room. Yeah. Has to take out a building. Yeah. <laughs> well, they'd have to go over a drainage area. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Got it. So if that big, nice big area, and all the kids want to come out and play football and baseball and all that, and now who says, well, you know, we don't want the baseball game to come in our backyard? Well, I think they're going to. I think they're going to leave it rustic. Oh. Is the way I understood it. They they're going to mow. They want me to finish landscaping 30 feet behind the homes or the the condos and then they want to kind of leave it more rustic back there and other than their garden and they talked about the drainage area that has to stay clear they were talking about maybe mowing that so they had little walking paths maybe but yeah. it's kind of uh, kind of up to them negative comments that i saw on the planning commission then were about the trail connection that was one of them. One of them was on-street parking. Yeah. And then for every on-street parking we lose, we gain four off-street parking. Yeah. So. Pretty good. I yes. think that trade. Yeah. Yeah. They were concerned that driveways were too close together to look at the other part. And then none of the residents in there wanted that trail connection. That's what I read. That was what I read. The sidewalks yeah. in there. In that time, when that PUD was set up, there was no sidewalks incorporated into it. There were walking trails. Yeah, and yet the thing that, that we did have a couple of them come up and talk about safety of the kids in the neighborhood. Once I explained about the sidewalk being on the other side of the street, I said that's a good thing. It says all the kids are across the street on that sidewalk mm -hmm. versus walking through this area. Well, there's also an ordinance that kids can't play in the street. Yeah. <laughs> and finally, this is a big part of our master plan, yeah. that we needed more housing for yeah. elderly. So this is, I mean, a real benefit to the community in that capacity. Yeah, right now I'm working with about five or six people for the first building, which only has two. So we're going to try to do two right in a row, one this month and one next month finish it up next year, we'll be done. Okay, any other? Thank you, Mr. McCann. Right. Thank you. If you make some of my uh, manager's report, just with the uh, electric council, we're going to be starting with our USDA project on the 20th, and we'll be authorized, the staff will be authorizing payments to that contractor probably in advance of council meetings, but those payments can't be released until they're authorized by the USDA. Anyhow. So they're the ones that release the money to our account and then we can make those payments. So just to let you know that's the process that we're going to follow. Um, last year, or last year, last week, I apparently erroneously reported that the library was going to share in the cost of FOIA policy. They apparently adopted their own. So uh, they don't need to use ours. We got our MERS uh, actuarial valuation report for our pension fund. That's some very good news. Our funded ratio increased from 88% in 2003 to 93% in 2004. So that's, that's good. That's very good. Uh, so our unfu unfunded accrued liabilities decreased by about $150,000. So we went from 368000 almost 369000 to just a little under 218000 unfunded accrued liability. And of that amount, which is just shy of $218,000, we already have designated 175000 in our fund balance for our unfunded liability. So basically, at this time, we only have about $42,000 that's unfunded. But, uh, Deb and I have already uh, talked about this. Their merger is projecting that in 2016 that our monthly payment would be reduced by about 50%. So 
So we've already started this year paying, is it 10000 extra yeah. towards that unfunded liability? Yeah. We think we're just going to continue that momentum going forward so we'll have this put behind us. And, and out of our, our of our hair. So we're doing really well there. That was great, great news. Um, tax rolls. Uh, council is aware that our city assessor, our new city assessor, going through the tax rolls, has found two uh, organizations, the Red Flannel Festival and also Hope Network, that were not on our tax rolls. And according to the assessor, neither organization, per state law, are exempt from property taxes. So he has and or will put their properties on the tax roll. He's notified both organizations and let them know the reasons for the change. And, you know, there may be others as he becomes more familiar and looks at our tax rolls. We're also uh, working uh, with the assessor on two other situations. The Flying Club that's out at the old Lagoon site, they have a, a license agreement with the city that gives them exclusive use to about six acres of property. And he stumbled across that looking at something else. And because they have exclusive use of the property and, uh, and authorized by the city, then that property has to go back on the tax rolls because it's not open to the public. And so the city would be responsible to pay those taxes. Now, I've already, we're going to tax ourselves? Well, our, that, those six acres have to go on the roll, okay? So it would be our responsibility. I have a meeting uh, uh, the week I get back from vacation with the president of the Flying Club, and we have a resolution. It, I think the tax bill is going to be about 250 300 bucks. He says, we'll pay it. So that way that gets them what they want. So we're working on that, and we had uh, the reason he found out about that was he was out looking at the property, or the rest of the Lagoon property, because we have a farmer that wants to do nothing mow, other than mow the property and then bail it, feed it to his cows. Um, so if a for-profit organization is using the city property for profit, that property also has to go on the tax rolls. Any property? Huh? Any property? City property. Any, any city property that's being used? For, for profit. profit? For profit, yes. Oh. So, and that's why, you know, and, and so this is not the best time of the year to meet with a farmer. Mm -hmm. So we're working on that. But I think we've got it down to, he was going to pay us a per acre amount anyhow. And we're really close that per acre amount covering our taxes. So it'd be a win-win. It'd make the property look really nice out there. He'd get something out of it. We wouldn't have to pay the taxes. So we're working on that. We'll bring something to the uh, city council in the future. If you remember, when we when we uh, entered in the agreement with the Friends of Skinner Field to operate Skinner Field, we went through probably seven or eight different iterations of their bylaws to make them agree correctly that the, that, that whole area was open to the public, wasn't exclusive use, wouldn't have to be on the tax rolls, things of that nature. So uh, we're getting better at it. Uh, the uh, EDA grant application with, uh, in terms of West Street Extended, the 16-mile road and the associated Utilities. I filed their short form grant application. It's nothing more than putting them on a notice that we would be interested in such a grant. Um, the project cost would be about $3.3 million, all told. They would grant up to $1.65 million if, the grant, if this was uh, approved. So about half. About half. I also had discussions with uh, representatives from the right place. We're going to meet later this month to talk about some other opportunities for grant funding from the state to offset the, the, the balance. I did have a quick conversation with Victor Hansen, who owns Display Package, as well as Hansen Realty. Uh, he's willing to contribute something for the project. He just doesn't know. You know, I caught him off guard. He said, yeah, we'll contribute. I just don't know how much. So we think we can put together a project to, to make that happen if we can get the EDA funding. Um, just a reminder that I'm on vacation the 11th to the 18th in 
during my absence, will, Linda will be the acting city manager. And as always, I'll be available by uh, cell phone and email. Probably some of the better news for the night is uh, just yesterday I got a uh, letter from <coughs> Forus LLC. They're a buyer developer of property that's on White Creek, south of 17 Mile Road, between right to the back of the Sitco gas station and just north of the old Sand Tire. They're buying that property and they want to annex into the city to put a retail um, operation there. What is the procedure for annexing? Uh, basically, this is it. Yeah, they, they, asked, uh, they asked to be annexed in so they can receive city uh, water and sanitary city utilities, sanitary sewer utilities. We have uh, added on our agenda. We notify the township about it. The township can come in here and say what they want if they want to say anything. And then the council approves it, it goes in. And they would be connected to our water and sanitary sewer system. But they're looking at um, putting three retail businesses in there. And, and they, I'm not at liberty right now to say what they're going to check. But I think it's going to be, in my opinion, it's going to be a real just to clarify on the annexing, are we talking about an agreement like we have um, with Solon Township, on, or are we talking about actually moving the city limits? It would be that, that property they have right now is in the phase two of our current 4.5 agreement, and that's it's laid out how properties in that phase two can be added. Okay. And then that's what they're following right now. Okay. So not an actual true annexation. No. Well, it, it, it is because they are bringing, we are bringing township property into the city. But okay. it's, the, the mechanism is already set up. And, okay. And all this has been agreed upon years I, ago. So, I'm yes. just trying to clarify. Actually, yeah. someone asked me the other day. Right. And having been from Flint, where big chunks of property were annexed, like out in Burton and so on, right. city. Right. I know they actually become part of the city, right. but this didn't feel like that's quite exactly what's happening yeah, here. They, they become part of the city. We provide them. Um, right, but the city, the city, um, <coughs> the city lines don't move. Am I correct? No, the well, city lines are already drawn there. Those properties that are within the city boundaries are residing in the township. They pay their taxes to the township. Right. Once they request annexation through 425, they're liable to transfer to the city, and then at that time the city can accept or reject. But the township has already agreed. Uh, the city and the township have an agreement not to cross the expressway. Basically, anything on the east side of the expressway is eligible in the 425 area. I see. Okay. In, in, in actuality, the, the city limits change because we're bringing this in. Yeah, the person who's asking you is actually asking about voting. Like, are you a resident of the city or are you a resident of well, the township? Well, in this, in this case, there's no residential. No I residential understand, property. but in the event, this was the question that they asked If they're me. living in this, if, they're, if that property is in the city and they're living on that property, they're a resident of the city. Okay. And I didn't have a good answer to that question. So that answers that question. Okay. And uh, that's the end of my report. Okay. Any other? We have a slight, we have about 10 minutes left. So we need to get up. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions?